Good afternoon. I am Maggie Harkins, Dean of the Holy Family School of Nursing, Holy Family University School of Nursing and Health Sciences, and I'm honored to welcome you all here today to commemorate the 50th anniversary of our nursing program. 50 years ago, Holy Family University conferred its first Bachelor of Science in Nursing degrees to five graduates of the class of 1973. Since then, more than 6,000 nurses represent Holy Family's nursing alumni. Our nurses are critical thinkers, collaborators, and highly successful patient-centered care professionals. Our nurses are leaders in their fields and solidify for us that excellence in nursing begins with a Holy Family education. We have a wonderful panel of alumni experts today, but first it is my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Ann Prisco, president of Holy Family University. Through Dr. Prisco's leadership, there is a renewed focus on the sciences and on programs designed for in-demand jobs. From the creation of <clears throat> new degree programs in technology and the growth of our nursing programs to be offered with clinicals in 10 states, to the expansion of our footprint in Newtown with a third campus location and plans for a center for innovation with a focus on the life sciences, cybersecurity, and entrepreneurship. Dr. Prisco was honored with the Philadelphia Business Journal's Women of Distinction Award. She serves on the board of the Association of Catholic Colleges and Universities and the Association of Independent Colleges and Universities of Pennsylvania. She has forged strong partnerships throughout the Philadelphia region designed to strengthen our presence and maintain our reputation for educational excellence. Please join me in welcoming President Ann Prisco. very special day, folks. Welcome. Welcome to all of you. What a legacy we have to build on, huh? Congratulations to all of our folks who've been through the program, who are in, involved in teaching the program, and all of our students who are in the midst of learning. Uh, my hat's off to all of you. As many of you know, I always say I never left school. Um, education has been my passion, so I have such a deep respect and appreciation for those of you who choose to be in the healthcare field. That was my off-the-cuff remarks. Now I'm going to give you my formal remarks. <laughs> so it is wonderful to see so many of you. Our School of Nursing and Health Sciences is ranked in the top 24% in Pennsylvania and the top 18% in the nation among nursing programs across the country. Those are impressive statistics, and they are possible only through the excellent work of our faculty, many of whom join us here today, the applied knowledge of our alumni, all of you, and the commitment of our students to contribute their talents to this critical field. But know that after 50 years of the highest calling and the highest caliber of nursing education, we are just getting started. Science continuing evolved, and so must we. If the pandemic taught us anything, it is that the nursing profession is the linchpin to quality health care. We know there is a nursing shortage that is only going to worsen. So the time is now to place our efforts and resources into innovating when it comes to educating nurses. And we have heard time and again from hospitals and health care providers that a Holy Family nurse arrives with a reputation for first-rate knowledge and first-rate care. All of you are part of that legacy. So congratulations to each of you for standing as role models for those that follow and for being the embodiment of excellence that's represented by healthcare and Holy Family University. We're all in for a treat this afternoon as we welcome our stellar panel of nursing professionals and how very proud we are of them. Collectively, the panel encapsulates best practices, care, critical thinking, compassion, and a wealth of knowledge and leadership. And we look forward to hearing from them shortly. And, and next, I'd like to introduce 
Francesca Valenti. Francesca has stepped up for us, and in addition to a very heavy nursing course load, she is now, she's the president of our Student Nurses Association of Holy Family. Uh, Francesca is from Northern New Jersey, and she spoke about meeting someone who was a nurse and how much that meant, and she couldn't imagine that she too now would be at this point in her career and looking forward to becoming a nurse herself. So welcome everyone, and thank you, Francesca. Thank you, Dr. Crisco. Um, unfortunately, um, Reverend Dr. Lorena Marshall Blake, um, the president of the Independence Blue Cross Foundation, is running late, so she can't be here to give her own remarks. Um, but I just wanted to point out how the Independence Blue Cross Foundation does a lot for Holy Family. They are the largest benefactor of nursing scholarships that this university receives, which I know a lot of us are really thankful for. <laughs> Um, including myself, most definitely. Uh, so for those who don't know me, my name is Francesca Valenti and I'm a senior nursing student here. I'm also a first generation college student and being a recipient of an IBX scholarship has helped me focus on school as well as motivated me to push myself harder to succeed. Um, I even found myself in a leadership role position as the president of the Student Nurses Association. Um, so in this role, I am like a liaison for the faculty and students. I help uh, facilitate like donation drives and I help guide underclassmen through the nursing program. Although my senior year has just begun, I can see the end in sight and it's bittersweet. I've had a wonderful time at Holy Family, all thanks to the tight-knit community, uh, the supportive professors and the great friends I made along the way. This experience wouldn't have been possible without my scholarship. I'm honored to stand before you today among this panel of impressive Holy Family grads, and I look forward to following in their footsteps. I hope you enjoyed today's discussion, exploring current trends and the future of nursing, uh, facilitated by our excellent de vice deans, Dr. Jinzy Matthew and Dr. Michelle Murphy Rosansky. Testing, testing. Everybody can hear us? Yes. Hear me. Welcome, everyone. Uh, I am Dr. Jinsey Matthew, Vice Dean for School of Nursing and Health Sciences. I will be one of the team who will be facilitating today's panel discussion and um, asking questions from all of us, students, alumni, and facilitating this. So welcome, everyone. Hi, I wasn't sure if mine was on. I'm Dr. Michelle Murphy Rosansky. I'm the Vice Dean of Health Sciences within the School of Nursing. I would like to say thank you to our panelists and our guests uh, for coming to share your Holy Family experiences. Uh, we would like to begin by having each of the panelists introduce themselves and give you a brief uh, description of where they are. So we'll begin from left to right. Hi, can everyone hear me? My name is Karen Book, and I am the Chief Nursing Officer at Penn Medicine Princeton Health, which is one of the six hospitals in the Penn system and the only one in New Jersey. I received my BSN from York College of Pennsylvania in 1997, and then um, 11 years later graduated with my MSN right here from Holy Family, and just recently graduated with my doctorate from the University of Pennsylvania. I have uh, three children at home, so I've been doing this while I've been raising them. They're 20, 18, and 15. My daughter's here with me today, home from college. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, within being the chief nursing officer, I oversee uh, close to 1,500 nurses that are practicing in the acute care and outpatient setting. And um, like I said, the, the hospital's growing, the only Penn Hospital in New Jersey, and I'm proud to be the chief nurse there. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, and um, I was, um, you mind with me? I was just appointed as the assistant dean of clinical practice for the University of Pennsylvania School of Nursing. All right. Oh, that's good. Definitely happy. <laughs> Thank you. Happy to be here. Can you hear me? Okay. So I'm Chaudron Carter. I am the chief nurse executive for the Temple Health System. I oversee six campuses, 
um, as well as being the CNO of our main campus. I have a few of my um, nurses and our leadership in the audience, so I have to, okay, they're waving. <laughs> um, so I um, am a graduate of Holy Family year 2000. Um, I went on to uh, get multiple master's degrees from St. Joe's. Um, I got another master's, two from St. Joe's, another master's from Wilmington University. I also got an educational doctorate from St. Joe's. Went back and got another PhD. I'm crazy. I know. <laughs> a PhD from Walden University. Um, and so my role as the chief nurse executive and overseeing um, all of the six campuses that we do have is the visionary for nursing. Um, I am the, the um, sole responsible um, party of sole responsibility. I have the sole responsibility of nursing practice across all of those campuses. I am honored to be in that role. I've been with uh, the health system for about nine years in multiple roles. Um, and so, um, you know, that's, that's where I am. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Janice Gibson. And for you nursing students out there, I sat in your shoes at one time, and I could never envision being here today, being able to give you the advice and empowerment in your role as you move forward. Um, I've been a nurse for 26 years, and I went to nursing school while I raised three children. I went to the Episcopal Hospital School of Nursing. It took me 10 years to achieve my BSM, which I did here at Holy Family in the BSM, or in the BSM program. Uh, I then went back for my master's here in nursing education. Uh, my background is in critical care. Um, I've taught clinical here for about 10 years. I see many people I know. It's so exciting. Many mentors. Uh, my three children are all nurses, so the impact is far and wide. Um, right now, my role is of nurse residency coordinator at Jefferson North for Bucks, Frankfurt, and Torresdale. And for me, that is like the epitome of um, my role. I love nursing students. I love new nurses. And I really want to see you be successful and grow. So um, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Good afternoon. I'm Peg O'Grady. I'm the administrative director of the Asplund Cancer Pavilion, which is part of the Sydney Kimball Cancer Center at Jefferson. Um, we're located in Willow Grove, Pennsylvania. Uh, our reach is, is far and wide. We see patients probably about three hours away, um, either Jersey, Delaware, Pennsylvania. Um, our goal is to reduce the burden of human cancer. Uh, and with that, uh, we built this building five years ago uh, with the thought and anticipation that we would probably see about 200 patients a day. We're seeing 400. Uh, we are treating in an infusion center 100 patients easy a day, um, and I have the honor of being able to work with about 200 staff. Um, but the vision and the mission was, you know, we're, we're growing. We know that there's going to be a gerontologic tsunami, and with that, cancer certainly will follow. And we needed to come up with a strategic plan of, you know, how do we make sure that our community, our, our Abington, Willow Grove, Montgomery County community is well taken care of? Um, so you're going to hear a little bit about that today. I am incredibly honored to be on this DIAS with so many talented experts. Um, but I want you all to think of, about what's your vision? You know, where do you want to be? And hopefully we'll be able to give you some ideas on how to get there. Thanks very much. Hello, good afternoon everyone. My name is Trisha Nichols. I am an alumni of Holy Family with my bachelor's degree and my master's degree in 1998 and 2010. I finished my master's degree. I'm Coach Byrne from the women's basketball team's big sister. Um, just in case anyone, shout out to Byrne. Um, I do have two adult children. I did have twins when I was a junior in nursing school. I went part-time for one semester um, during my delivery times. And that was kind of crazy. I was 21 years old at the time, but I've lived through it and I survived nursing school and adult children were still working on that part. But 
Anyway, I am a very proud patient experience director for Jefferson right now. Um, I started my nursing career at Jefferson, but when it was at Frankfurt Hospital, Frankfurt Tarsdale, I've been a, a, a med surge nurse and ICU nurse, nursing educator, clinical nurse specialist, and kind of just evolved my role because I had a vision of kind of what I wanted to do. Um, my role was a little bit of what they call the junk drawer of the hospital. I'm a little bit of everything. I swim in everyone's lane because my responsibility really is to manage the reputation of our organization across our northern region. So to me, um, nursing advocacy is important. Patient advocacy is just as important. Happy nurses, happy patients, it's a thing. So, um, you know, I do a lot of service excellence training. So I do have a little bit of education still I'm able to provide to people. But I have a great networking with a lot of different interdisciplines, and I love every second of my job. So, um, yeah, 25 years, yeah. Thank you, Patricia. I'm Alan. Um, can you hear me? Is this working? Okay. Oh, uh, sounds weird. Uh, so I'm one of the very first graduates of the Accelerated program here. I graduated in the second cohort back in 2016. And uh, it seems like just yesterday I was standing in this uh, auditorium for the pinning ceremony eight years ago, and uh, here I am. So uh, in that time, I did med surge nursing, OR nursing, and then for most of my time, a very unique subspecialty officially recognized by the ANA called parish nursing. So I got certified in parish nursing and did a lot of community outreach um, while I was going to, my, uh, to get my FNP. So uh, two and a half years ago, I graduated as a nurse practitioner. And so today I practice uh, at a um, private practice called Tri-Valley Primary Care. I'm a family nurse practitioner. That's up in Quakertown. And um, that all happened in the blink of an eye. So uh, I live up there with my wife, my two boys, Alan and Joe, and a third on the way. So <laughs> We have some very fine and excellent panelists with us. So let's begin on our topic of exploring current trends and the future of nursing profession. Um, children, um, please share your thoughts on how has your work been affected by the current nursing shortage and how do you foresee this evolving as new nurses enter the workforce? So I'll, I'll start by saying, thanks for the question. I'll start by saying all of those that are graduating, you have a job at Temple. <laughs> Jefferson, and Jefferson, call me. <laughs> so, um, you know, we all know that the climate, climate of nursing and the nursing shortage is progressing. It will continue, um, you know, We've worked really, really hard with our leaders. We've worked hard with our staff to really think outside the box and try to look at how do we mitigate our short staffing by doing something different. Um, and what we've begun to do is start to recruit nurse nurses internationally. So in the next year, we have 100 nurses coming in from all different parts of the country that will start to permeate our health system. We, um, at present, we have about 11 in-house now um, and that we're onboarding them. As we all know, the health systems are very close in Pennsylvania and we have to do something different. We are just taken from one organization to give to another and we're not making any traction. Um, the other is that we've developed many pipelines as it relates to Temple University. And so um, those partnering schools that we have in our community, we've gone into those schools and begun to work with our juniors, um, junior high school students to talk about nursing and give them opportunities to see what nursing looks like. Um, many of those students think nursing is a nursing assistant um, and that's okay, you know, because that is the purview that they have from their community. What we've, just, what we've done is we've ran camps over the summer and brought those students in to allow them to see nursing in real time. Um, I, 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 I thought Dr. Marshall would have been here because she's a partner in this as well. Um, and so those students um, have gotten scholarships. We were happy to offer 18 scholarships to those students 
that have graduated high school and went on to, um, you know, ad be admitted into the nursing program at Temple University. We continue to develop other programs for them. So a lot of these students are living in the community and they need, you know, financial help. So we've developed uh, uh, like um, jobs for them. Um, we have uh, student uh, navigators. So what those students do is go into our emergency departments and do the admission databases. And we pay them for it. And they are per diem employees um, so that they can continue their nursing program and nursing school and, and focus on their nursing schooling while still working. And they give us the hours that they can give us. And we're not uh, married to them doing eight hours or 12 hours. That helps them. Um, the other is that they do um, all of our, they do our discharges uh, for those patients that are being discharged and, you know, helping to get them out of the department, out of the units. Um, so we're thinking creatively uh, from a health system standpoint to try to mitigate some of the shortages. But, you know, the literature tells us that we have to grab these students that are in high school early on. Some universities, I know Penn also is doing some of the same things, but they're starting to take a jump into junior high school. Um, and just showing students what nursing looks like in hopes that they begin to understand that this is a, a career that I would like to, you know, look more into and to become a nurse. Thank you, children. That's a great point of bringing that awareness um, at a very early on to just highlight that and bring more nurses to combat the nursing shortage. Thank you. Okay. Um, Peg, I'm going to direct this to you. It's a little bit longer of a question, so it's a couple of parts. So what area of nursing do you foresee becoming more prominent in the future? Do you think degree advancement will be more prevalent for nurses? More RNs are going back to pursue a BSN, more BSNs pursuing MSNs, and MSNs pursuing doctorates. Do you foresee this trend continuing? Yeah, I, I have to be uh, uh, really to the point. When you become a nurse, if you are not a lifelong learner, you're going to have difficulty. You know, education is absolutely the key because I'll give you an example in oncology. Asplen is starting a new program. It's called CAR T therapy. It's T cells that get attacked with drug and it kills cancer cells. Those programs alone in the country will bring on 400 new types of drugs in less than 10 years. We have a pipeline of therapy coming, and if you're not able or willing to continue your education, you're going to be left short in how you care for your patients. So, you know, every day we have huddle, and every huddle there's an education session whether it's honestly, you know, how to make sure you're doing a great intake on a patient or whether it's something as unique and novel as a phase one drug that's never been tested in human subjects before. So you look at that gamut and that's only at one cancer center and you maximize that by university settings and other institutions, it's gigantic. So I would say, you know, look at what you love. With myself, when I was discussing my master's degree with my mom, who's a nurse, and all my aunts who are nurses, um, <laughs> I said, you know, what do you think? And they went, oh, you have to go into business. And I said, business? I, you know, I, I would never have put myself in that role ever. They went, no, you really need to go into business. So my master's is actually a master's in nursing research and in business administration. It's a unique novel role that LaSalle offered me at that time. But I then went on to go get my Lean Six Sigma, because Lean Six Sigma gives you great project management skills. You can run any program. So if a new program starts up, you know how to systematically think through what you need to build a good program and how to sustain a good program. And then, you know, now we're going into really unique research and, and incredible growth in how to do new surgical procedures for cancer patients, we just did our first high pec case, which is an incredibly intensive 
um, abdominal OR surgery where they instill chemotherapy into the body during an OR procedure. And then CAR-T therapy and now radiation therapy, we're looking to treat patients that have the opportunity to, if they have multiple brain tumors, treat them in one sitting as opposed to multiple. I mean, this is, this is cutting edge opportunity, but it all rests with your education. So if you're not gonna be a lifelong learner, you need to think, is this the right job for me? Um, and, and degrees matter, you know, absolutely degrees matter because you master things. You, you learn to think out of the box and that's exactly what Holy Family taught me was the ability to do that. So yeah, I'm, I'm all for it. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Peg. I'd like to add that as the coordinator of the residency program, the first thing that we do at seminar one, and I see one of my nurse residents here and I'm not gonna point her out, but I'm so happy she's here. Um, I have a picture up of somebody at the starting line getting ready to perform a race, but I say there's no finish line, right? In nursing, we're lifelong learners. Um, we continue to evolve. Um, how you treat a patient 10 years ago isn't the way we treat them today. So everything is continuing to evolve, technology, medications. Um, and it's exciting, guys. It's exciting to be able to have that opportunity to learn all these things. So always just go into it very positive and wanting to learn everything that you can. Thanks, Jenna. Thank you. That, that leads us to one of the bigger term, quality improvement. So Tricia, are you? Uh, especially post-COVID, how can nurses promote sustainability and substantiality in quality improvement? Thank you for that question. And I can start by saying there's nothing that a nurse can't do. I think nurses should literally run every hospital organization <laughs> there is known to man. But um, nursing's are, nursing is so important when it comes to quality improvement. But the most important part for nurses to know is that when you're on your unit and doing your independent care of your patient assignment, and you go home and you come back and you come home and just do your daily tasks, that's just doing your daily tasks. But to be a professional is really to get involved in your unit share governance and also the committees that are out there. Because I remember sitting there saying, who, when I was a med surgeon nurse, like my first five years, I'm like, who writes these policies? Like, where do they come from? So I really, I was not really sure because I was not inter introduced to like, where they, I know where to find them, but who does them? And I can tell you, I'm very proud of this. Um, in 2009, one of our medical, when I was a nursing educator, one of our medical directors came over to me and said, we need a rapid response team here at the hospital. I said, okay, what, I was not really sure what a rapid response team was at the time because it was a fairly new concept, but there was a story behind why they were developed. And I said, well, let's go, let's do it. So I went and researched it, found out the story behind it, how the mom who lost the baby because the, the, the healthcare worker did not, didn't listen to the mom saying something wasn't right. And she went and pioneered, like, every hospital has to have this system in place. So you used to hear codes overhead call all the time, but they really wanted every hospital to have a system in place where you would actually be able to call a rapid response. And as a med surge nurse at the time, yes, I was an ICU nurse. I'm like, wow, if I would have had that when I was in med surge, I may have would have called it on a couple of patients before they actually code. And it's still in live today because we collaborated on that. And that's one of my proud like things that I never thought I could do, but someone asked like, yeah, let's just do it. And just not to be afraid to think that you can't make change. But if you don't know your numbers, if you don't know where your unit's falling out, whether it's patient experience scores or blood culture contamination scores or infections or wound cares, people developing wound cares, then you don't know how to evoke change. So it's up to you guys to be, to be, to inquire about it and to kind of want to find out a little bit more about your numbers of your specific unit. And then you'll be a rock star where you work because they're going to be like, wow, I'm going to go to her next time. She's showing the desire and that drive to change. And that's where you get pulled in. And then that's just how you grow as a professional. So that's kind of where I sat. I just was inquired about something. Oh, let's do it. Someone comes to me. Let's just do it. So yeah. nurse, you guys can do anything, anything. And we're excited because a lot of these uh, panelists up here, we, we are in collaboration with some new exciting ideas. So we're, we're very, we were really excited beforehand. Can't wait to get started on it. So yes, you can be the change. Thank you. Okay, Karen, I'll direct this one toward you. Nursing burnout hit hard during the pandemic. How did you or your nurses push through? How different are things now? And have you noticed employees taking steps to prevent from happening again, like all the mass changes? No, that's a, 
big question. Yes. <laughs> um, so going back to COVID, March 2020, when everyone was closing up shop and going remote and learning how to live our lives within our homes, we all forged out to the hospitals. Um, and most definitely, I agree that that's when we learned that a nurse can do everything. Every, everyone else really could have left the hospital because the nurse ended up doing the meal trace. The nurses ended up doing the cleaning of the rooms. The nurses really took on a lot of that responsibility because we could. And we were the, basically the sole providers going in and out of the rooms. So burnout, I think in the beginning um, for our nurses, I'm sure you'd all agree, it was a little bit of a, you know, adrenaline, like, you know, um, for those of you who, I think some of the students probably weren't even alive during 9-11, but e e everyone would come, everybody came in to, to see what they could do to help. And I feel that in the beginning of COVID, that's what happened. Um, they're going to, everyone's going to be there. Everyone's on board. But what happens at your, in, in your home and when your healthcare workers start being inflicted with illness of COVID, it was burnout. And because the nurses were taking on the responsibility of others and also becoming caregivers and loved ones for the patients um, as they were as they were at the end of life, it became very trying. And what we try to do is as administrators is be supportive, make sure they had what they needed because anything that we could have done to prevent them from having to find PPE, to um, even meals, we organize meals. What can we do to take off the plate of the nurses to make them less stressed because they need to be um, at the bedside? We also um, did care rounds. We had a psychologist that had come in that had worked with 9-11 survivors. So he would come in and go to, um, specifically in the beginning, to the ICU nurses to do debriefings, um, lots of tears, um, lots of emotion. We also had a nurse practitioner, a psych nurse practitioner, who came in and talked to, talked to the nurses because we also had to look at mental health and, again, what was happening at home. So as leaders, I also said, as a leader, I also said to myself, what's happening in my home is what's happening probably at most of the people's home, um, trying to take care of children when you're not there. Uh, so what can we do to help? And we gave out meal cards, like I said, um, did the meals, really tried to be good with giving people off when they, when they needed off, giving extra bonus dollars for coming in extra. Ended up did costing a lot of money, but it did help people whose um, spouses were laid off or didn't have jobs. So just really the work environment, I think creating a work environment for where the nurses could feel comfortable and feel supported was one of the best things. People still talk about it. Um, and then also celebrating the wins. Many of you, I'm sure, um, it became very popular to play um, a song overhead when a COVID patient was being discharged. So that was a feel good thing um, to make people feel good about, um, you know, they were sitting with dying patients and death was in front of us every day. And to see someone being discharged and do well, and it felt good to have a, a you know, a, a parade of people and clapping somebody leaving. So those are feel good things that we had to put in place as well. Um, I don't know if anyone else has anything to add. Is I do. <laughs> <laughs> so um, COVID, right? We had a nurse residency program with new nurses who said to me, Janice, I didn't sign up for this, <laughs> right? And, you know, you want to validate that emotion that they have. Um, we were lucky that we had a supportive um, leadership team that we kept our residency program on Zoom, right? We went to Zoom automatically and we had um, leaders come in and do, you know, mental health with them and talk to them about their stress. We were able to do breakout rooms. Um, I wasn't practicing at the bedside, but I would go around, you know, checking on everybody. And I just remember in the beginning, the fear was palpable because no one knew what was going on, you know, what was going to happen. And you're right. They were taking on duties that they weren't supposed to be. Um, doctors were refusing to go in the room. Physical therapy was refusing to go in the room. 
and I just kind of thought to myself, I'm more on the psychological part of it, and I kind of tapped into that Navy SEAL mentality, which I was teaching the residents and all the nurses, you know, chaos is contagious, panic is contagious, but calm is contagious. So I always would go around and say that to them, and we had our um, leaders let us buy um, lotions and those scent things, those lavenders, remember Trish? Um, and we used to just go around and just like, you know, hey, we're here for you, you know? Um, and we're gonna get through this, right? Because we're nurses, right? Yeah. So, um, and here we are, right? We have weathered the storm and we're moving forward and that's the beauty of it, right? Because that's what, what we're we do. doing. What we're also doing now, because I think part of the question was what we're doing going forward. Um, since then, we have asked um, the nursing staff, like, what do you need during the day to help calm? Um, and so we have opened Oasis rooms. So we, we were able to advocate to convert some of the supply rooms or empty offices to Oasis rooms. So now there's nice paintings, there's uh, massage chairs, and you can sign up to go in there. I mean, it's, it's for everyone, but it's, they're stationed on the nursing units. And the nurses find that to be comforting if they're having a bad day or just need time to relax. Uh, so those are expanded throughout, throughout the hospital, and they seem very excited about it. Yeah, I think if anything that evolved was all the wellness and resources and the amount of support that nurses have right now that we see. So that's very positive. And you have the therapy dogs. We have the therapy dog. Um, we have a wellness room. We help. have a wellness manager. Our CNO got a $7 million grant. Um, so we hired a wellness manager who's amazing. And she works with all the Always staff um, to, you know, goes around with a the therapy dog. And um, she comes to all our nurse residency seminars and does a half an hour of stress relieving activities with them. Um, so she's She's just amazing and has been really um, amazing for our organization. Great. And one other unique thing I just wanted to point out, which I just remembered, is um, you know, you all sign up for ACLS classes, PALS, BLS classes. We actually did a mental health um, class, and it was led by our nurse practitioner, our psych nurse practitioner. It was signs to look for in your colleagues that, that they're struggling. Maybe it's um, PTSD related to COVID, which we see a lot of, or just something's off with, with your colleague. And we were able to give that course. I mean, it, we, we didn't know how it was gonna go off, but um, we've already had 40 people go through, go through the program. So um, that's been really successful as well. Uh, the one thing during COVID that I think made the most support to the staff was the constant communication. So, you know, every day we had the opportunity to give everyone updates. Here's where we are. Here's the education and training that we want to make sure you have. Here's all the safety equipment that we have to make sure you're taken care of. And if you have staff that are sick, we promise you, we will engineer to make sure your unit's safe. And I think we, we stuck to our word. Um, we had open door policies for every manager Every manager, once COVID was announced and there was shutdown, because cancer doesn't stop, um, every manager said, we'll commit to being here for the next three months, and then we'll start to take time, because we'll need it. But when you have an entire building full, plus inpatient, and you're transitioning patients back and forth, the messaging has to be crystal clear. And you have to make sure that your staff feel confident and comfortable that if they're talking to a patient or a loved one, if the patient's inpatient, how do you make sure that they're getting the right messaging? We got really creative with the iPad. So if a patient was inpatient, they could talk to their family. If a patient you know, needed to get a consult and they, no family member was permitted in the cancer center for a period of time, we had them on telephone, we had them on video, we had them on whatever we could connect with to make sure that the family was part of that discussion and decision making. So it was a huge technology transition, something like I've never seen before. Um, but it was also the fact that keeping everybody daily in the know made all the difference in the world. I did not lose one RN. I was amazed. And it's simply because they felt like they were part of being the solution. 
So, you know, I, I, I really committed, and, and I think the whole team committed to making sure that everybody was taken care of, that they would be safe, that they would have enough equipment to be able to do their job well. And we would pull, I mean, there was a time when there was, you know, six, seven nurses out due to COVID, we pulled resources. Um, but that's what nursing does every day. There, it, we get really creative when we need to. Um, and, and I think it made the difference. I do want to add that um, during the pandemic, what came out of that is the resiliency of nursing. Um, you know, we can talk about what COVID looked like across all organizations, but the resiliency of our nurses that kind of stepped up to the plate, irregardless to whether or not they were going to get sick. I know at Temple, we had a whole, in our ambulatory um, building, we built a whole COVID hospital. We had over 300 patients in a separate house, in a separate building, and then housed our regular patients in the regular hospital. Our staff said, take the agency nurses and put them in the regular hospital. We're gonna take care of our COVID patients. So and when we talk about resiliency, I mean, when I heard that, I just started crying because um, it is that impact that our staff have in the dedication to our community and our community of patients, irregardless to whether or not they had this COVID disease that nobody knew about at the time. We were pivoting day by day, hour by hour, because we didn't know what we didn't know, right? Today it was this, tomorrow it's something totally different. Um, I just remember we were in executive meeting and we were beginning to talk about this pandemic that was going to hit and how was we, how are we going to house these patients? And the chief medical officer at that time turned to us and said, this is going to be nursing like you've never seen it before. And we were like, what is she talking about? And she says, you're not going to be able to take care of patients like you used to. And you need to start to socialize that to the nurses. Well, we didn't know what that meant. We were like, okay. Um, but now we know, right now we know. But I just want, I don't want us to forget that nurses are resilient. You have to stick, stick together. Um, and through the pandemic, that's how we got through. You know, it was day by day, we stuck together, we kept each other afloat, we encouraged each other. And, th and there were times and days that, you know, you did have to go somewhere and just cry because it was overwhelming. Um, but we made it through. So. I can illustrate that a little bit if I have a minute to do so. No, I, I, I could. Yeah. I wanted to thought about some things. So the resiliency of nurses and the uh, if it needs to be done, ask a nurse attitude and the uh, truth was uh, illustrated so well by the parish nursing department that I was part of at Sacred Heart. Um, so I just rode the coattails of amazing nurses that came before me in that program. So if you don't have an idea of what that was, similar to street medicine. So Lehigh Valley Hospital had street medicine and St. Luke's Sacred Heart had parish nursing. And our job was to go to the homeless shelters and the food uh, pantries and various other faith-based and, and community-based uh, services for the unsheltered people in our community and just offer medical care in any way we can, even if it was on the street. So many amazing people, and I was just along for the ride. Pandemic hits. Um, we have a pretty substantial population of unsheltered people in the Lehigh Valley. And uh, what was going to happen with all of our patients now that the homeless shelters shut down and said no new residents and the food pantries where they went to go get warm shut down and said, well, we'll do bag lunch, you know? And where were they gonna get their health care from that point on since we didn't have our normal setup sites? So street medicine and parish nursing coordinated with the counties to use some of the funds from the COVID relief uh, act to buy hotel rooms. And when we had one of our unsheltered people in the community who tested positive and had nowhere to go to isolate, you were told to isolate, well, what if you were unsheltered? So um, thank God, you know, we were able to actually find a motel that agreed to this because various hotels who started to agree to it stopped um, offering that to us. And so we sheltered our patients who were COVID positive in the hotel uh, to isolate. 
but who went and did their medical care and their exams and brought them the food and even we bought prepaid cell phones for them through the funds and anything else they needed it was the nurses and when my wife found out that I was going to be going into hotel rooms to COVID positive patients in the first month the pandemic happened she said you're gonna do what <laughs> so, I was undressing in the garage like I think a lot of us nurses were but uh, I mean that I just like to share that story not because I, I did anything special but the nurses stepped up to do it with our one N95 we were allotted <laughs> you know <laughs> <laughs> so, but I remember I, I mean, before we knew before we knew I, I like what you said like before we even knew what COVID was in store and what it would do to you um, I looked like I was on a moon, on mission on the moon you know going into uh, the hotel so anyway just to illustrate uh, your point about nurse thank you thank you, thank you. that was a good wrap of some some huge words like resilient, calm, uh, is contagious. That's a definite takeaway for all of us here too. We'll move on with, you know, which kind of goes back to the same resilient and all that retention is another huge word. And I know all of you are kind of thinking about it and looking at it. Janice, I will um, go with you for this. What are some of the new nurse retention strategies and how to combat turno uh, turnovers? So it definitely is challenging right now, right? Because we are no longer seeing the nurse that's in an organization for 30, 40 years. Um, nurses are now looking for other opportunities to move um, from different places. For me, I think I try to, you know, my theory is, you know, find your home away from home, right? And where does the retention fall into that? We have a student nurse external program where I think really is the starting point for us where we want to have, you know, nurses, student nurses come in and do the extern program, be hired as a patient care tech while they're finishing out their program and then get hired and enter into our nurse residency program. Um, having the nurse residency program is a retention strategy where we do support our new nurses as they transition through the first year with um, networking with content experts, having stress relieving activities, just checking on them through the year. I mean, I wish I had something like that, um, but it is something that we're doing. Um, getting our nurse residency program accredited, we're working on that. We're gonna have a slight visit with the CCNE um, in April. Um, having the nurses know that they have a voice by joining shared governance, that they do have a seat at the table in the organization, um, to impact change. Um, additionally, um, joining committees. Um, we give out vouchers for certification. Um, we do many things. What else, Trish? We have a lot of wellness programs. I mean, I could go on and on and on. Um, but it is really important and something that we are looking outside of the box at different strategies to retain nurses. Um, salary, benefits. Can I add one? Yeah. Um, we just started, uh, or not just, maybe over a year, our RISE program. So that is, um, it's called RISE. It stands for Resiliency in Stressful Events. And now that COVID's over doesn't mean, re you know, stressful events aren't continuing to happen every day. So maybe you work in an emergency room and you just had a, a I'm not going to say any, any, a bad situation happen, maybe with a child or you see you know, a couple who's been married for 75 years and the husband just lost his wife. And you know, as a first death in your career, that could be a pretty stressful event. Um, I mean, we all watching the news, you know, um, definitely workplace violence and violence in our workplace is a huge thing that we're all paying high attention to. And maybe you get involved in a situation where you felt unsafe because there was a patient or, or someone, a family member that came in because when people are sick, they act sick. They, they, they don't act normal. And sometimes when you think people, you know, their, their biggest challenge is sometimes is the family dynamics that happens, especially in, in the midst of a really crisis situation. So we have a rise response team that are on call 24 seven, that if you're having really a tough time adjusting, even continuing the rest of your shift, you can give a phone call and a person will come just talk to you on the phone. And a lot of times it's just having the conversation just to talk about how scared you are or, you know, and maybe sometimes you have to send them home. 
but it's, we have a rise responder who are trained in psychological first aid to make sure people who are dealing with stressful events can kind of I okay. think rewards and recognition are important in retention strategies as well. And, you know, I've been at Jefferson for probably 18 out of my 26 years. I've left and have been charge nurse at Pennsylvania Hospital. I did other things, but I always came back to what I feel is my home um, because you have those relationships with the people that you work with. And I always tell my new nurses, you want your workplace to be like your home, you know? So to me, that's super important as well. Um, having that healthy work environment. So we're really um, working hard on that for them to have those pillars that the American Association of Critical Care Nurses have with the um, authentic leadership, um, skill communication, all those things. So um, it's every day working hard to keep our nurses and to keep them happy. The work environment um, is vital and what you're providing to the nurses to help them stay. But what one thing that we have just implemented with our new um, evaluations and have asked our managers to do stay interviews with all new employees, um, I'm sure you all heard of them, but the expectation then is that at three, six, nine months, and then a year, we are talking and doing these stay interviews with new employees to say, how's it going? Is this what you really expected it to be? How is the, how is the unit? How is the department? Is there something else that you feel that you want to accomplish? Is there goals? And um, it's amazing the things that have come out of these stay interviews, such as, well, I really wanted to work at CCU, but I don't really know if there's a position. So you have nurses sometimes looking for other other jobs when during these stay interviews we're identifying how we can move and shift people to really get them what they need and that in their goals and to keep them and retain them within our organization so that's been really successful for us yeah, that's great. okay thank you uh, i have one more i know oh, I sure one more. my apologies the one thing you want to ask everybody is what's keeping you up at night so i can tell you that during covid we asked every nurse and we absolutely did stay interviews because you know to, to lose a nurse during a pandemic is not a good deal um, but we were fortunate enough that we told them every bit of this is anonymous you have every opportunity to write us blindly and leave it in an inbin you have every opportunity to meet with us independently you can meet as a group we, we don't care how you meet just meet and, and let us know if there's something that we really need to be working on. Um, that saved a lot of people from shifting and moving to other careers. And it also formed teams to work on ideas and opportunities. So stay interviews, I'm all for them. I, I think they're great. Um, and I also think that the more this, the team as a group can come up with under you know, a magnet umbrella or, or other grouping, work together, they're amazing at the ideas they come up with. So, yeah, definitely. Great. Thank you. We're, we're, we're getting down to our last five minutes. So, okay. And your, the next question is directed to you. So go ahead. And then we'll <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say, just from recent experience and having graduated, how important that is to speak up and make your feelings known. Mm -hmm. When I first started nursing, I thought it was sink or swim, and I can't show weakness, and I have to perform. I didn't sometimes speak up to any problems I saw or safety concerns or advocate for myself. And I guess that's what I'm trying to say is the most, I guess the best advice I could possibly give any of you guys going out to graduating soon, advocate for yourself. I was the one running for every call bell because I didn't use my resource. The MAs, on, I mean the assistants on the floor because I thought it was my responsibility. And when there were safety issues, I didn't call the nurse manager because I thought, well, the nurse manager on duty doesn't want to hear about my problems. But, like, what I'm hearing from all of y'all is you can be talking to someone, sit, like somebody sitting here, who will have your back. And that's the awesome thing, is that you're, you're going to a manager who is a nurse. So, anyway, advocate for yourself, absolutely. And I was in that situation where I was going to leave for another opportunity very shortly after. And they said, well, why don't you just tell us? And then they opened up a position to retain me. Yep. So, at our end. It's, it's worth its weight in gold. So, 
Thank you. Right. Affirm you. I, I just want to jump in really quick. I, I do a session called Brief with the Nursing Chief, and they're open sessions. And what I do is do, um, you know, the state of affairs of nursing for the health system. And then I kind of give two or three points, and I open it up to the staff. It's open. It's I do breakfast, and then I do one at night, and I have stats. And you'll be surprised at all, of, and it's no leaders, right? It's just me and the staff. And all of, and I had staff that says, you know, I'm looking to leave, and they, these are the reasons. And we were able to retain those nurses because they opened up and they communicated with some of the opportunities that they found. So I think it's important communication as leaders. It's important for us to go out to the staff and communicate to them and try to hear their concerns versus you know, thinking that they're gonna bubble up. I, you know, I, I do rounds, I go out to the floors, I go to all the shared governance councils once a quarter. It's a lot of work, but it's worth it for me because then I can hear the concerns of my nurses and my ancillary staff and we can pivot and do something totally different. Thank you. Okay, our last question in this panel, Alan. In the past few years, we've seen telehealth become more prominent in our society. How has this impacted your career so far, and how do you think it will impact nurses moving forward, or nurse practitioners, as we talked about? Okay, so as a nurse practitioner, a primary care provider, I obviously use televisit maybe a bit more uh, than uh, a BSNRN would. There isn't a day go by that I don't have a, uh, a visit with somebody virtually, which is great. It's opening up a whole new uh, opportunity to treat people who may be immobile and obviously also uh, retain revenue for us. So that's a great thing. But I'm going to focus on the essence of the question for a new RN. Technology, new. How do we use it and what's our expectation? I hope some of you at Dr. Harkins as a professor because everything she told us came true for better or worse, okay? And I do remember the one thing she, she told us a story about when uh, the pulse ox first came out, the size of a TV. Uh, <laughs> And uh, you, you'll, don't be surprised if when you're on the floor, a new piece of technology rolls out and they'll say, here's the instructions, read it, and figure out how to use it. <laughs> and that happened. So uh, I don't know if the urine wick was fairly new. Urine wick for when females. I started. <laughs> that was fairly new. And Fantastic. being a, a male nurse also made it very interesting. <laughs> so I had to figure that out. One of Dr. Harkin's favorite things, she said, don't be surprised if six months after graduation you walk in and they say you're going to be charge nurse. And I thought, Lord, help the unit that I'm charge nurse. So almost six months to the day, Dr. Harkin's laughing on my shoulder, ha, 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 because I went in and I was charge nurse. So um, that's going to happen to you too. She also said, "What? you don't know what you don't know. She said, that'll be. And that is so true. And um, uh, so technology, how is it going to impact us? It's really cool, actually. There's some um, really neat things coming out. Ambient listening technology, where it can do your charting based on your conversation with the patient. Um, AI is coming into that. There, there are small elements of AI that you may see in the charting, like the, um, I forget the name of it. Is, the, is it the, uh, not the Muse score. There's some other score. Uh, which will tell you how how close your patient is to sepsis. I've been off the floor a little while, so I forget. So it used artificial intelligence to to take that information, let you know who to keep an eye on. Um, I really wish the telemetry main unit was somehow mobile. So every time somebody's leads came off and it was beeping, uh, you had to run to the unit, you know, in the central central unit. So. Um, it's great that we're in this uh, in this time because technology is only going to make uh, our, our job easier, better, and uh, more efficient. And uh, I think the most important thing is safety, keeping us safe. Um, yeah. We're rolling out the virtual nurse stand at our Frankfurt campus. Yes. Um, so they're going to be, you know, on the screen in the rooms, you know, taking admission assessments, watching patients for falls. And also, if you have a chance, go on and look at Maxi. It's a robot now that they have in the hospitals that are helping the nurses with their supplies. So that's where technology is going to. Yep. Uh, thank you so much. Um, we are now going to take some questions from our audience.
students, faculty, anyone? Testing, testing. Oh, there you go. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Eddie. I'm a sophomore nursing student here at Holy Family University. And my question for you guys would be, what characteristics do you guys separate a great nurse from a good nurse? Good question. Can I start that one? <laughs> As a patient experience director, I can tell you, when patients come to the hospital, just like when you go to a restaurant and you order this, your favorite steak, you expect that cook to know what he's doing and to make the best steak you have. When patients come into the hospital, they expect you to know what medicine they're given. You've been trained, you're a registered nurse, whether you're a year new nurse or a 10 year new nurse. Um, and just the connection we make with people is what's gonna make you from a good to great. So I get all the patient complaints. I'm like the customer service of the hospital, but I also get the compliments. And I can tell you a lot of the times they don't even talk about the clinical care that they receive, not that it's not important, but they talk about, my doctor listened to me. They took me serious. My nurse was so nice. She sat there with me and explained things to make sure I understand when I got home. It is all that, and I am not even fluffing that. That is truly what's happening, and 98% of our feedback is they're, they're great because they were so nice and they were just so caring. I think it's the humanistic part yeah, to what we do. Um, you know, we get so hung up on the task and not seeing the patient. So the, the, you're there as an advocate for the patient. Focus on the patient, the task will come. And I think you start out good all the time, but you work towards being great. So eventually we're all gonna be there and you will be there as well. And I agree with everyone. It's how I always see divide, like the, the good nurse from the great nurse to the nurse, how you made your patient feel at the most vulnerable time. There was a research done at Penn about um, patient experience and um, during these salient episodes of, you know, when you're in labor, it's when the epidural's going in, when it's, um, you know, if you're post-op surgery patients, it's pain. And really looking at those specific things within your patient and how you dealt with it and how you made them feel during that vulnerable time. I'm Victoria, I'm a junior nursing student. And uh, my question is, the NCLEX has changed since you all took it. The Next Generation NCLEX debuted in April 2023, now including partial credit on questions as well as five new question types. It had a pass rate of 94%, which was significantly higher than the previous version of the exam. What are your thoughts on these updates, and have you observed any changes in the workforce recently as a result of the new test? I wouldn't say so much the result of the new test as I would say it's a result of um, how confident and comfortable students feel with hands-on care and hands-on communication. And I, I think that's part of our job to, to give you that sense of comfort, um, to give you that sense of mentoring. Uh, the most important thing that you can do to study for the test, of course, is to get to know all of the content to the best extent that you can, but it's your critical thinking skills and mentoring that make you a really good nurse. So, you know, I'm gonna put it to you this way. I think, I think there are those that test well. I think there are those that excel at people. Um, and nursing is everything about people. So, you know, think about the test itself, which is really important. I remember sweating boards. Um, <laughs> big time, uh, but, but I also think that I had outstanding mentors, and that's what really moved my career forward and helped, helped gear me into oncology, to be honest with you. You know, I, I did have an extern program. It was magnificent, and I had mentors for 30 years at one institution and then transitioned into Jefferson and got new mentors that are phenomenal. So I, I, would, I would think that NCLEX is an important piece, but I would also think that your guidance really becomes crucial. Do we have an next question over here? All right, uh, my name is Jamie. I'm a senior here at Holy Family. I graduate in uh, December, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> and my question for you guys is, when hiring for a new nurse, what is the single most important attribute you guys look for? Yeah. 
professionalism, you really wouldn't believe how many nurses come in jeans, t-shirts. It really is, It you need to be professional and um, come with a portfolio, things that you've learned, things that you have done in school, projects, any research papers, and be able to really um, answer the questions with heart, but also be able to show how your clinical skills and your classroom skills really helped you get to where you are for, for graduation. But I would say you would be surprised how some people show up for interviews. Professionalism is very important. Right, and they say first impressions could be lasting impressions, mm -hmm. right? So. Yeah, I would also say I know there's a nursing shortage, but you also you need to be prepared. You can't come in flip flops, and you need to know the organization that you're interviewing for. Oh, absolutely. Very good Please. point. Yeah, good point. Very good <laughs> point. Um, the, yeah. Go onto their web page. Go onto their nursing page. Know what they're known for. I mean, I'm not saying you have to go in with statistics, but at least know where you <laughs> where you are <laughs> when you're interviewing. <laughs> We're going to look for critical thinkers. And the one thing that, that I do, I don't know about anybody else, but I bring a whole team. So, you know, we're not shy. We'll, we'll individually talk or we'll talk as a group. When you walk in the door and you know that you have a focus in a certain area, um, we'll ask you to come back and spend a morning session with us. We need to know that you've seen what our workflow looks like and that you feel like you can become a member of the team. That's really important. But then also the team needs to have a certain sense of who you are, what your mission is, what your passion is. And, and then that really helps to guide whether that team's going to gel. I also think having an enthusiasm, right? Humbly asking questions, you know, learning about the organization. And then if you feel that it's not a fit, it's okay to say that, right? And then you want to move on and maybe look for something else. Can I offer something? Thank you. So uh, I don't hire anybody, but from being, from being on the other side, uh, one of the places, don't be afraid to ask if you could come back another day and shadow for a few hours on that unit that you're interviewing for. Uh, I had a friend tell me they're not just interviewing you, but you're interviewing them because you, what did you go through to get this degree? Uh, uh, so interview your organization in the best way. The best way is in that sort of uncontrolled environment where you're going to shadow for a few hours. That it really helped me make my decision about it, a certain job that I was going for. So ask for that opportunity. Those three or four hours you might choose to shadow even less, well, that will pay dividends for making your decision. Yep. I forgot to tell you, I wasn't a student athlete. I would hate to, I would hate to not say that I used to be a student athlete here at, the, at the Holy Family and play basketball. And teamwork is a huge, important piece of what I brought from being here as a student athlete to my workplace. You are nothing without your team. So you may have, you know, weak, weaker links of the team and stronger wings. I would stick with the stronger links and just be part of the team and always be willing to assist and help. So a lot of my questions really revolve about how, how are you in a team environment regarding being supportive because during COVID like we've all, all talked about before is that not only nurses are part of the team it's everybody so we have people where we shut down offices or procedural areas that they were the ones who were training the nurses on the floor because everyone needed to be a part of the solution and we were able to train people who were never in the nursing units to be there for us and people appreciated that like wow people are coming to help us so team being a team player is super important. Hi, uh, my name is Brittany. I'm a senior nursing student. I'm actually a last question. Um, but my question is, what's the best nursing advice you've ever been given? Or what advice would you give to nursing students as they prepare for their NCLEX and entering the workforce? I think um, something that someone said to me that resonated is never measure yourself against someone else's ruler, right? You're all going to grow and learn individually. Um, run towards things that make you afraid um, because that's where you're going to learn and just know that every day, every single day that you walk through those doors of whatever organization you work for, you're going to make a difference in somebody's life. And it could be 10 years from then that they're going to come back and say, I remember you and this is what you did for my family. Uh, 
Go ahead. One thing that I, my uncle had told me back in the day was nursing advice per se, but you know, I always wanted to be a nurse from my time I was 13. I just remember having a, a situation where I was like, I never want to not be able to take care of somebody. And he always said, you know, work it, when you love what you do, you never work a day in your life. And I'm sure you heard that before, but truly you may hate some of what you do during your day, but focus on what you do love and incorporate that into your everyday because that's what's going to kind of keep you driven to continue to do what you do and continue to love what you do and self-reflect on that. So on your whys. I would say that as you prepare to study for the NCLEX, you know, really focus on that and then, you know, where you want to work, but always stay true to yourself and know just like everyone is saying that you are a nurse and you're going to, to work every day the way anyone else is going to work every day to make a living. But every single time you step into a patient's room, it's an, it's impactful. And again, at their most vulnerable state, and they're going to remember that they're going to remember how you treated them. And if you stay true to that, and as being a new grad, also, don't be afraid to ask questions. There's, there are multiple times that I'm sure you all have had this where the nurse said, well, I just didn't feel comfortable asking, or I felt this was maybe not the right thing to do, but my preceptor has been a nurse for you know, 20 years, speak up. You have to speak up and um, like you had said, and advocate for yourself and get involved. Get involved um, in your shared governance, in committee meetings and really make the most of it. One more thing? Okay. My, uh, one of my best nursing managers would always ask us, what are you doing for self-care? And I loved that, that she wasn't just focused on are you going to be here and work extra hours and pick up an extra shift and do 16 hours? Um, but I, I can't end without mentioning one of the core uh, uh, core components of Holy Family's um, mission, and that is uh, God in everything. Because uh, that really kept me going. And I'm not sure where you are on that, but the ANA recognizes the spirit as one of the components of the, of the uh, human person that we nurse to. And that... Uh, that element meant so much to me. And uh, even in nursing, we had the power to put in a consult to uh, the chaplaincy service. And that meant so much when I would do that for people. So please look for God in what you do, because we really are service to others. And that's what makes you different than other guys down south. <laughs> 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 All right. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so yeah. much. <laughs> that was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you all very much for being here. And a special thank you to all of our alumni, our experts, and our vice deans for running this panel with an excellent discussion. Now, please join us in the Center for Teaching and Learning for refreshments and student research displays and some mingling. Students, please do not hesitate to approach our alumni guests and ask questions. This is a great networking opportunity for you. Get contact information. If you don't get to talk to them today, I encourage you to reach out to them on LinkedIn. They're all on LinkedIn and ask your questions. Thank you again and have a wonderful weekend. I hope to see many of you tomorrow at the Tiger Fest homecoming. Thank you. Thank you.